Russia is under attack. On Friday 22nd of March, terror was unleashed in Moscow when a group of terrorists stormed the Crocus City Hall, a major concert hall in the Russian capital, with rifles in hand. The attack took place around 8pm when a concert of the Russian rock band Picnic was about to start. There were more than 6,000 people at the venue when a group of armed men allegedly got out of this white Renault symbol you are seeing on screen and headed towards the main entrance of the concert hall. Moments later, the attackers Saiga machine guns began to be heard. Curious fact, the machine guns had double magazines fastened with insulating tape, which is what is known as Afghan configuration. As you can probably guess, it got that name precisely because it was a setup widely used in Afghanistan. Visual politic community, there is no doubt the attackers wanted to carry out a massive slaughter, which is exactly what they did. From the entrance, the terrorists moved into the lobby and then into the auditorium, firing point blank at everything in front of them. Not only that, they also used flammable liquids to set the building on fire. The result? At least 137 dead and hundreds injured. It was the largest terrorist attack to hit Russia in more than 10 years. And the questions logically are, what on earth happened? Who is behind this massacre? Was it ISIS? Was it Ukraine? What are the consequences for Putin? Well, we're going to take a look at all that right now. We are going to see what Russia looks like under attack. Let's get started. <laughs> Visual politic viewers, the Russian reaction has been clear. There is more to this attack than meets the eye. While all fingers point to jihadism, in the Kremlin, they began to tell a different story. For example, in a televised speech following the massacre on Saturday, Vladimir Putin naturally condemned the attack, but he also did something else. He pointed the finger at Volodymyr Zelensky's Ukraine. According to the Russian president, Ukraine would have tried to help the attackers escape across its border with Russia before the Russian security services gave chase. In the speech, Putin did not mention jihadism at any point. The only specific reference was to Ukraine. But it is not only the Russian president. The same night of the attack, Viktor Bondarev, a member of the Federation Council and former commander-in-chief of the aerospace forces, pointed directly at Ukraine. The deputy chairman of the Security Council, Dmitry Medvedev, also mentioned this country. On top of that, the Commerçant newspaper also published for the first time alleged indications of the Ukrainian trail, hints that were leaked by the government itself. They were the first to do so, but from then on, the Russian narrative has been turning more and more to attribute the blame directly on Kyiv. Russian authorities are promoting the version that Ukraine is behind the terrorist attack in Crocus. In exactly the same vein, officials of the FSB, Russia's Federal Security Service, said they had detained the four gunmen in the Bryansk region, bordering Ukraine, as they were fleeing to Ukraine. So you see, in Moscow at least, things seem pretty clear, don't they? Behind this brutal attack were the evil Ukrainians. But there was a problem. Or rather, two. At midnight on that tragic Friday, ISIS claimed responsibility for the attack. A statement that was picked up by both Reuters and the Emirati media outlet Al Arabiya. And not only that, many of the indications that Commerçant had published, such as the use of false beards or the membership of the shooters in the Russian Volunteer Corps that is fighting on the Ukrainian side, were soon proven to be completely false. This would not be the first time in history that Putin has used attacks with civilian casualties in Moscow to justify his military policy. Unfortunately, it is already apparent that the Kremlin authorities are trying to link yesterday's attack to Ukraine without any basis. Now, does it really make sense to link these attacks to the Zelensky government? Why would Putin want to do such a thing? Was it or was it not the Ukrainians? Listen up. The Crescent. So as it stands, things are still not entirely clear. But for now, we do know two things. ISIS has insisted and claimed responsibility for the attack on two occasions. It has even made public a video that the attackers recorded at the time of the assault and where they are seen uttering cries like Allahu Akbar while unloading the magazines of their rifles right and left. And not only that, at the beginning of March, Washington had information about a possible jihadist attack that would take place in Moscow. The State Department even issued a warning notice to American in Russia and also share the information with the Russian government. Meanwhile, Putin spurned this warning on television with words like these. All this is reminiscent of absolute blackmail and the intention to frighten and destabilize our society. And okay, I know what some of you are thinking. Josh, really? 
The Americans knew. How would they know if they or their allies weren't in on it? It's plain as day. Well, for those of you who think so, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this does not tell us anything at all. That the United States was aware of this threat is not at all unusual. If there is one thing Washington has done over the last few decades, it has been to try to monitor all the major jihadist groups. You could say it's their house speciality. And indeed, following the attack, the Americans have continued to insist. They have no doubt that the Islamic State is behind this attack. Specifically, the Islamic State of Khorasan, or ISIS-K, an organization that had previously attacked the Russian embassy in Kabul in late 2020. <laughs> This branch of ISIS has become the main rival of the Taliban, whom they blame for failing to implement true Islamic law since retaking power in 2021. Since then, they have clashed with the Taliban, attacked Russian, Pakistani, and even Iranian positions. Last January, for instance, they sowed terror in Iran when they attacked a tribute to former Revolutionary Guard General Qasim Soleimani, who was killed by US drones four years ago. The attack killed more than 80 people. On the day before the attacks in Russia, this organization even attacked attacked in the city of Kandahar, the epicenter of the Taliban movement in Afghanistan. In other words, we are talking about a very active group. But okay, I know some of you have probably been pondering a very specific question for some time now. What on earth does ISIS have to do with Russia? What kind of nonsense is that? Well, let's slow things down a bit. It's often forgotten, but the truth is that Russia is not free from the jihadist threat. We already talked about this topic here on Visual Politics about a year ago in this video. You see, approximately 15% of the entire Russian population is Muslim, a figure that is expected to exceed 20% by 2030. They are the forgotten ones, and soon there will be more than 25 million Russian Muslims. See for yourself, these are the seven Muslim-majority territories in Russia. The five autonomous republics of the North Caucasus, along with Tatarstan and Bashkortostan, in the Volga Oral region. These are regions that have not always exactly been peaceful. In fact, when Putin came to power, he had to deal with a series of major Islamist attacks. The two most well-known, and that many of you probably remember, were, firstly, the assault on the Dubrovka Theater in Moscow in 2002, when several Chechen fighters took hundreds of people hostage. It ended with almost 200 fatalities. Then, there was the terrible Beslan school massacre in 2004, which resulted in the death of 334 people, 186 of whom were children. More recently, in 2017, another Islamist attack ended the lives of 15 people in the St. Petersburg metro. So when it comes down to it, all this talk of Islamist attacks is not exactly new in Russia. And that's not the end of it. In recent years, there has been a lot of talk about the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. But what is not often mentioned is that Russia had to deal with its own version of the Islamic State on its own territory. I'm talking about the Caucasus Emirate, an organization that sought to create a new independent state governed by a very strict application of the Sharia, and which would occupy the entire North Caucasus. That is, not only the autonomous republics of the region such as Chechnya, Dagestan and Ingushetia, but the entire territory from Dagestan to the Sea of Azov itself. Visual politic community, we are talking about the territory that has the worst economic data in all of Russia. The five autonomous republics of the Russian Caucasus are among the ten poorest regions in the entire country. Their social and economic data are very bad. This is, in fact, one of the reasons why Salafism, a rather radical branch of Islam, has gained considerable strength in these territories in recent years. As if that weren't enough, these regions have been particularly hit hard by recruitments to fight in the war in Ukraine. And let's face it, few things make you more hateful than losing a son, a brother, a friend, and so on. Those are the kinds of things that make it easier for the population to become radicalized. But now let's return specifically to the Moscow attack. Exactly what concrete indications point to ISIS-K? <laughs> Well, the first indication, logically, is the group's own claim, in which they even published photographs and videos of the attackers before and during the attack. And remember, the claim was made through AMAC, Daesh's own communication agency. Secondly, we have the US warning at the beginning of the month, and there certainly seems to be no doubt in Washington, ISIS is behind the attack. ISIS is solely responsible for this attack. There was no Ukrainian involvement. 
And that's not even all. Russia's own Federal Security Service recently said that it had dismantled a cell of this ISIS group in Kaluga, a city southwest of Moscow. In other words, we are talking about a group that definitely has a presence in the country. What's more, as a fourth indication, ISIS-K itself has denounced and pointed the finger at the Kremlin on several occasions for its interventions in Syria, Mali, and Burkina Faso, territories where the Islamic State is present and has clashed with Russian troops. And to top it off, we now know that the perpetrators of the attack appear to be citizens of Tajikistan. Okay, the perpetrators from these Muslim regions are not Russians, but we are talking about a Muslim country where ISIS is known to have some presence. What's more, this terrorist organization has been trying for years to recruit migrants from Tajikistan and other Central Asian countries in Russia who suffer very harsh conditions. Back in 2016, a note by analyst Marta Ter already alerted us to this issue. Check it out. Radicalism thrives among exploited migrant workers in Russia. The Islamic State is the most aggressive in this field. Russian is the third most used language in its propaganda, after only Arabic and English. Some migrants have described how radicals proselytize in and around mosques in Moscow, and also how people from the North Caucasus visit construction sites where they work and promise them work in Turkey or Syria. In total, three hypotheses are being considered. That it was the Ukrainians or the Ukrainian allies that it was a false flag attack to justify a new escalation in the war with Ukraine. Yes, there are also those who have suggested this, or that it really was ISIS. Visual politic community. The first one makes no sense. Think about it. Ukraine would gain nothing and gamble a lot. Not only would it justify a new escalation in the war and make any future negotiations very difficult, it could also cause Ukraine to lose the international support it so badly needs for maintaining its war effort. It is cynical that the Russian regime has started accusing Western countries and Ukraine of involvement in the attack. On top of that, the only evidence the Kremlin has shown is that the attackers were apparently fleeing in the direction of Ukraine. But the problem is that this is not true. The arrests reportedly took place in Bryansk Oblast, around the town of Tepli. The problem is that this locality is much closer to Belarus than to Ukraine. In fact, we later learned that this was apparently the destination of the alleged attackers. But think about it. It would make no sense to head for Ukraine, currently the most protected and controlled Russian border of all. To top it off, the Russian accusation has been constantly changing, which makes it kinda hard to believe. And as for Ukraine's allies, it's much the same story. Nothing to gain and too much to lose. To hurt Russia in war, there are much more efficient methods, such as long-range missiles. Then the false flag thing. Well, what can I say? Personally, I think it's totally crazy. At the end of the day, the attack could be a serious blow to Putin. Let me explain. Until now, the Russian president has presented himself to the world, and especially to the Russians, as the man with an iron fist. The great leader who was rebuilding the power of the motherland Russia. It was he who was restoring greatness to the country, and who had, once again, guaranteed the country's security. It was he who ended the insurgency in Chechnya, ended terrorism, brought Georgia close to the West, returned Crimea to the Russian people, and it would be he who would recapture Kyiv. Russia may not be the most prosperous country in the world, but at at least it would be strong and respected again. Even so, over the last two years, this whole narrative has been disintegrating. Whatever the Russian propaganda says, and however it ends, the war in Ukraine has been a failure. What was intended to be a military stroll in the park has turned into a bloody war, with hundreds of thousands of casualties and no happy end in sight. And now the attack may call into question the security achievements themselves, so it doesn't seem like the best false flag action in the world. There are much more direct formulas than not rebooting fear at home, or making Russians question Putin. So, from our side, and with the information we have right now, we rule that one out. And that leads us directly to the third hypothesis, that it was indeed ISIS-K, which is where all the evidence seems to point to. Now then, why is the Kremlin so keen on singling out Ukraine? by singling out Ukraine, they could be trying to turn a problem into an opportunity. You see, on Friday 22nd of March, before the attack, the Russian press published two news items. In the initial item, for the first time, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov no longer speaks of special military operation, but 
of war. In an interview, he said that Russia was indeed in a state of war. It is an important change of discourse that may be the prelude to many new decisions. Yes, it started as a special military operation. But as soon as this alliance was formed, when the collective West became a participant on the Ukrainian side, it became a war for us. And in the second item, it was published that plans to recruit 300,000 new soldiers to attempt a new offensive in the direction of Kharkiv could be well advanced, according to sources in the Russian Defense Ministry. Well, singling out and blaming Ukraine could facilitate all these decisions. The idea would be that the Russians would forget to question their leader and want revenge. In other words, it is in Putin's best interest to point the finger at Ukraine, despite the fact that there is no evidence and that Ukraine had nothing to gain from the attack. Путін замість того, щоб займати своїми громадянами Росії, звертатись до них, добу мовчав. Well, visual politic viewers, this is all we knew at the time of making this video. Beyond the conspiracies of all kinds that are proliferating through social media networks at the speed of light, for now, everything seems to point to ISIS-K. And if confirmed, this could represent a major water leak in the already eroded pipes of the Russian regime. But at this point, the question is now for you. What do you think has happened? What will happen next? And will Putin take any drastic measures? As always, leave us your impressions in the comments and let's start a debate. And now, if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politic. Thank you so very much for watching. Take care, and I'll see you next time.